Welcome to Greenville United Methodist Church. Um, hold your bulletin up. Let me see that you got it. Because there's a lot of important information in there week after week. And if we stood up here and read it word for word, we would never get to lunch on time. So I'm just going to highlight some things. Uh, on the back, on the calendar, first of all, there is a finance meeting after service today. So if you are a member of our finance committee, please stay after the service for that meeting. And then tomorrow at uh, 6 p.m. is our quarterly ad board meeting. And um, I just want to say that for those that feel like you never know what's going on in the church, ad board meetings are open to everybody um, that, that's a part of the church. And that's a place where you can kind of find out what's going on in the church. And although you may not have a vote in kind of what happens if you're not like one of the, the leaders, you can at least come and know what's going on so you don't feel so left out in the dark. And so uh, that ad board meeting is tomorrow at six o'clock. And then the other uh, thing that I wanna highlight is that our next lifeline is scheduled for May 18th. And there are a list of things that are needed there if you would read that and then um, pick up a few of those things. It, it um, isn't hard whenever you, I probably pop into the grocery one or two times a week. And if I get an, you know, an extra thing of pork and beans while I'm in there and then drop it off at the church, it, that kind of adds up pretty quickly and it helps out our lifeline ministry quite a bit. And so... Um, and so read the rest of the things in your, in your bulletins, those prayer concerns and the other announcements, and um, let's read our call to worship. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod, thy staff, thy comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
Father God, we're just thankful for this day. We're just thankful that you are a good shepherd who has gifted us um, with your Holy Spirit, God, that even though you do not physically walk among us and guide us in these days, God, you've gifted us with a spirit that we have the opportunity to dwell within us, God, that can lead us and guide us and, and um, just show us that we are never alone, God, and it gives us a peace that surpasses all understanding. God, I just pray um, that your spirit would fall upon us, um, not just today, but God, um, for eternity, so that we may be a beacon of light in this community and a house that stands on a hill for you, God. And we just pray, God, for your anointing over this service and this time together, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Worship with us. This is my worship. This is my offering. In every moment, I withhold nothing. I'm learning to trust you, even when I can't see it. And even in suffering, I had to believe. say it's wrong then I'll say no if you say release I'm letting go if you're in it with me I'll begin and when you say to jump I'm diving in if you say be still then I will wait if you say to trust I will obey I don't want to follow my own ways I'm done chasing fear
you guys ever heard that song before we just sang? No, me neither. I have never heard that song before. But you know what? The words of that song today spoke directly to me. Like, I had to sit up here and try not to cry because everybody was looking. And it was just exactly what I needed. God's really cool like that. So today, when I speak, we're going to be jumping around to a lot of scripture. But a big part of it is about a story about a man who was lame. Do you know what that means? Not cool? Yeah, that's definitely what it means in your generation and my generation. Lame is not cool. It can also mean that you can't walk. So this guy was 40, which is old, right? So he was like 40-ish, and he had been lame since he was born. He'd never been able to walk. And you know what his job was? He didn't really have one. Because there weren't paved roads, there weren't sidewalks. He couldn't really use, wheelchairs didn't exist yet. So his friends or his family every day. So the thing you need to know is he lived in a place with a temple. And the people would come to the temple and pray at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So every day they would come and they would set him by the temple and as people walked by, he would ask them for money. Does that sound like a fun job? Sounds pretty terrible, right? Okay, so I need a volunteer to be my lame man. Well, you have a lame arm. Do you want to be my volunteer? Thanks. Do me a favor. I need you. And you, and if you'll come over here. All right, so I'm going to show you a trick. I need you to hold my hands. I don't have cooties. Okay, you're going to do this. Come here. Turn around. Sit down in, on this arm. Like, you got to get lower. He's going to sit down on us, and we're going to hold him. You know what I'm saying? Okay, get lower, Cam. Get lower. There we go. So you're going to do that, okay? All right, stand back up. Now, except they're going to carry you because I'm too weak. You guys think you can do it? You can carry him without anyone? Okay, well, how about if we don't actually carry him? But you're going to be his friends and help him sit down right there. So you're going to be our, you can just sit down. They're just being your friends. There you go. Thank you. Okay, so he's sitting. All right, I need the rest of you to come over here. With me. Walk over here. Use your feet. You're not the lame guy. He is. Guys, you can come join us because his friends just left him there. They didn't stay. They didn't stick around. So, no, you can stay sitting down. Sorry, I'm doing a really bad job at directing this play. All right, so we're going to walk by, and he's going to say, can we give me some money, please? Can I have some money, please? So you're going to Temple. Walk down there by Tony. You can pretend like you give him money. Oh, look how generous you are. Keep walking. And then come back. But you two wait. Well, those two. You can keep walking. You can come back and sit down. Okay, so you're walking, but guess what? You're broke. You don't have any money. Okay? So we're walking. And he says, and you stop, and you look at him, and you say, look at me. Say, I don't have any money, but I can give you something even better. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And then he stood up. And then as they walked into the temple, guess what he's doing? What do you think he did? Well, he walked. Yes, that is directly in there. What else do you think he did? If you've never been able to walk in your whole life, and all of a sudden you can walk, what do you think happened? Well, he ran, and he leapt, and he jumped, and he praised God, and all the people who knew him lived in this little town like us, and they see this guy who's never been able to walk going, okay, stand up. 
I want you guys to show me what he would be doing. Stand up. Ready? What do you think they did? What do you think he did? Yes, he went, woohoo! Oh, I'm going to turn this off. And we're going to do it together. Ready? You guys are too young to not know how to jump. We're going to have to give some jumping lessons. Good grief. I did it. You know what? Years ago, when my kids were your age, we had a band. And I sang in it. And we would play right over there. And Charity and Mr. Shell would make fun of me because I would jump while I sang. They did. For real. But at least they made fun of me to my face and not behind my back. So we're going to invite the church to come join us because we have a friend right now who goes to our church. And he has been injured in an accident, and he can't walk very far right now, and he's really sick. And so we're going to take some time to pray for him. So if you guys will come and join us, we're going to pray, and we're going to pray like we pray in the chapel, which means pray when you feel like you need to pray. So come on down, please. to pray for Keith Bethel. And so I just um, invite you as God leads you to pray. And I will finish us up.
gathered, you are here with us also. And we are gathered in your name. And Lord, two or more are in that hospital room right now too. And we trust that you are with them. And so Father God, we just thank you. We thank you that we don't pray to a God that used to be, someone who has died, someone who no longer exists, but we pray to a God who is alive and who is a creator and who just speaks and things are. And we remember who you are. We remember your power. We remember your might. We remember that you are God and our reality is not your reality. And Lord, we remember that we see in part. And so we prophesy in part. But you, you see it all. And so, Father, our prayer right now is that you would touch Keith in such a way that any swelling in his body would reduce, any extra fluid would leave in Jesus' name. We pray over his nervous system and ask that any nerves that have been broken in this accident, that you would begin to grow them together at a supernatural pace, but just the right speed for healing. We speak to his immune system, Lord, and we ask that you strengthen it, but that you give it wisdom to identify the things that would come against his body and that it would not attack itself. Lord, may you be glorified, and may we all yeet, leap, and yell, and scream, and, and woohoo at your glory by what we see you do. And Lord, we just ask for an extra anointing upon Brother Joe, because we know that he is visiting them regularly. That when he touches Keith, that Keith will feel the love of all the hands in this place touching him. Lord, above all things, we ask that the peace that passes all understanding will come upon their hearts and their minds through Christ Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. What a wonderful group of young people we had sitting down here before us. Uh, As I come to sing for you today, I know that Charlotte is in heaven this morning looking down upon each and every one of us, as well as those in our church family that have also passed. We know that as Christians, we have hope. We have the knowledge that one day we will join our lovely families and we'll be able to celebrate and laugh and enjoy each other's company and be able to stand in the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This, the words to this song were written from a family that had, that were going overseas and the husband couldn't go uh, at, with the rest of the family and, and so the ship that they were on sank and he lost his family. And his pastor, from hearing this and and, and knowing the family, wrote the words to this song. So as Christians, we know that today and every day that it is well because we know our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and we have experienced 
salvation by coming to Jesus, knowing that through Jesus we have contact with, with God. So listen to the words of this song today and just celebrate the fact that we love our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is well.
Thank you, Ron. That was beautiful. Will you join us this morning in saying our offertory prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you that you can satisfy our every desire and need. Your word says that we should give honor to you with the first fruits of our wealth. Accept our tithes and offerings as a gift of worship to you. Multiply what we give for the effective growth of your kingdom. May Christ dwell in our hearts through faith so that we, being rooted and grounded in love, may have the strength to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. May we be filled with all the fullness of God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Isn't God good? Isn't God good? So the first time that we sang that song, Don Finley brought it in. And I thought it was really pretty and really nice, and I enjoyed learning to sing the harmony for it, but I didn't understand it. Um, Sang it probably for years. I was thinking, what does that song even mean? And then one day, Revelation, right? My problem was, is I have no righteousness, and so what does my righteousness have to do with anything? Like, I'm not right. I'm a sinner. I've done things wrong. I've lied. I've cheated. I've told people. I've manipulated. I've stolen. I've said things just for the sake of hurting people. I'm not right. And then as we sang one day, I realized that um, my righteousness is because he was right. And as uh, Ron said so beautifully, I don't feel like I need to preach this morning. He did a really good job of that. Um, It was his perfect life of no sin at all. And then his choice to allow himself to be killed. And then his victory over sin and his victory over death and taking back the, the keys from Satan taking back the authority of Satan and then rising again. And it was only because I believe in him that I have any righteousness. And so when you come and you sing that song and that, is our only defense against any judgment that would come is the righteousness of Christ. That is a powerful song. So that's a freebie. That has nothing to do with what I'm talking about today. Um, I will tell you this, a few weeks ago we were having lunch at Hobbies with my parents because that's what we do on Sundays and we were talking about hymns and we were talking about traditional or uh, contemporary music and you know those of us that are maybe a few years younger, that song's old just so you know, Um, but we were talking about it my dad was like they just say the same thing over and over again so what you need to know about Willard Keith is we had flashcards for everything. We had multiplication flashcards, we had vocabulary flashcards, and the vocabulary he would offer to pay us, you know, like I got 50 cents a card, and my, but my kids were offered like a dollar a card. So inflation's a lovely thing. I think my brother's the only one that took him up on it, but you know, you learn these words and I'll pay you for everyone. So flashcards, and so one day I was like, Dad, you gotta think about it as a flashcard. So when we're repeating it, it's so that it's making it deeper and deeper into your brain and into your spirit. So don't get frustrated with the song. It's like a chorus of a hymn. Just embrace it that it's a flashcard. We're just trying to get it in there a little bit deeper. So um, maybe that'll help. I don't know. Also, freebie has nothing to do with the message this morning. Um, My message this morning is... um, incomplete. But it was inspired by our Sunday school lesson, as so many things are last week, in the book of Luke. Um, We were reading Luke 7, and we continued it this week in our Sunday school class. Can you hear me okay? Do I need to adjust this thing? Trying a different mic. Good in the back. Can you hear me in the front? Okay, so I'm going to start with Luke 7, and we're going to work, we're going to hop around. So Father God, I need help, but you're faithful, and so I just ask that you take me out of your way this morning, and that through your word, people would either see something in scripture or hear something directly from you that is valuable. Holy Spirit, thank you for being here. We just ask for more in Jesus' name. So the um, story that I told the kids is in Luke 6, where there is a man 
who is um, injured or something, but from birth, he cannot walk. He's lame from birth. And so they bring him to the temple, and I'm in the wrong spot. Never mind. Okay, we're going to go from Luke 7. I'm, that's the Acts one. We'll go there. Luke seven ten. And when those... Well, let me tell you the story. So Jesus is, again, walking. And this is another healing story. And the centurion, who isn't Jewish at all, but he is over Capernaum. And so he works for the government. But he's watching. And so he has a servant that he really adores. And his servant is sick. And he's afraid he's going to die. And so the centurion says to him, or says, my servant's going to die. I know that this guy, Jesus, is moving around because he's very, he believes in Yahweh. He believes in the God of the Jewish people, even though he himself is not born a Jew, which means he can't worship inside the temple. He can't do the things that Jews have a right to do in relationship to God, but he believes. And so he also has a good relationship with the elders, And so he sends a message to the elders and says, will you please get a message to this Jesus dude? And will you ask him to come and pray for my servant? Now, if you think about it, if you are an elder of a sect that tends to be persecuted periodically, and you have a good relationship with the guy that's the government in the area, you're doing okay. And so with the guy that's with the government in the area comes and says, can you do this for me? And it does not directly violate your laws. Even though you may not know what you think about this Jesus dude, you're probably going to do it. It's like a good idea. And so the elders come to Jesus and they're like, Jesus, will you come and, and heal this guy's servant? He's a good dude. He takes care of us. He really cares. He believes in our God. They start talking him into it. And he's like, yeah, I'll go. So he starts walking, and the, the uh, centurion says to somebody else, and he says, go to Jesus. He's coming. Go to him. Tell him he does not have to come. Just tell him that I understand what it is to be under authority. So I represent Rome here. Caesar is over me. If Caesar says jump, I jump. That's what was so powerful. If you saw me grinning during the song that Charity and Rochelle sang, I've never heard that song, but they already gave this message. If he says jump, I jump. If he says do it, I do it. If he says don't do it, I don't do it. And then I have people under me. And if I say go, they go. And if I say stop, they stop. And if I say stay, they stay. And this Jesus clearly has that kind of power. So go tell him. He doesn't have to come. He just has to say the word, and I know it'll be done. Just has to say the word, and I know it'll be done. And so the messenger comes, and the messenger says, Hey, Jesus, the centurion said, You don't have to come. He totally believes everything that you say will happen. And Jesus says, Okay, he's healed. Now, before I tell you a little bit of what happens next, I want you to hop back to verse 646. Before this, Jesus is telling the parable about a house that is built on a rock. And it says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you do not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood rose and the stream broke against the house, and couldn't, he could not shake it because it had been built well. But the one who hears and does not do them, so does not obey his teaching is like a man who built his house on the ground or on the sand, if you remember the song from Bible school, without a foundation. And when the the stream broke against it, 
Immediately it fell. The ruin of the house was great. So what has happened is Jesus is talking to the leaders and he's talking to the Jews and he's talking to the people that they have been looking for the Messiah for their entire lives. For generations they've been said that they have been taught a Messiah is coming and here will be the signs and here's how you will know and here are the prophecies about it and they have been looking and they are taught from childhood to pray, Lord, please bring the Messiah in this generation. Please let us see the Messiah in this generation. Please, Lord, please, Lord, please. And then he is saying to them, why do you say, Lord, Lord? Why do you say you're a great teacher? Why do you say these things, but you don't do what I tell you to do? And then here is the centurion who has been raised in none of it. But he understands the truth about God in a way that the people who had heard about it didn't get it. He understood the authority of Christ. And what Jesus said about him. He said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who sent returned to the house, they found that servant well. I will tell you, I have been fascinated with miracles the last few weeks. I've been fascinated with miracles for a long time, um, for the sake of the miracle. But what really has struck me during this Easter season, as I went back and I read about Christ's death and his resurrection in each of the Gospels that week was that how many times it said, and the miracles were done for God's glory, and this was done for God's glory, and this was done so that they would know that this was true. And I had a season, and I've told you guys about this before, but I had a season, I don't know, 10 or so years ago when everybody that I would pray for was healed. Like, the first time that it happened, I prayed for a woman who wasn't able to get pregnant, and it was, I kept saying no, God kept saying yes, and he wouldn't leave me alone. So finally, I chased the woman to the parking lot. I think I've told you this story before. And I'm tall, and she's short, and her, he, arm, or her head was about armpit level, and here I come with my arm around her. And it was summertime. I'm sure it was a bad experience for her. But I prayed over her. And I prayed that God would give her a baby, which is scary. Like, when you go to things like that, they tell you, don't tell people they're going to have babies, you know? Like, don't make that promise to anybody. And so, but I was dumb and new to this stuff, and I didn't know that. And so I got a call nine months later, and it was like, hey, hey, how do I use this disability insurance that you sold me? Because I'm due in two weeks. And I did what the lame guy did in the parking lot of the school where I got the phone call. I yelled and I leaped and I cried and all the things because God had, had healed her. And it got that way and it got to the point that I was just like, this is crazy. I obviously have the gift of healing. And the big part of that was the I in that statement. And I thought I was some part of it. Because I would pray for people. I had a woman who came up one time and she said, when I went for the scans, there was nothing there. And I was thinking, I have no idea what she's talking about. But apparently I had prayed with her about cancer. And when they went to scan, the cancer was not there. They could not find it. But as soon as I entered the equation, the equation was off kilter and when we don't humble ourselves, God will do it, and he quit. And I started praying for people, and they weren't healed. And then I got scared, and then I got quiet, and then I quit praying for people. And so I recognized that the miracle has nothing to do with me, or God's love for me, or his disdain for me, but it has everything to do with him. God uses very broken people. 
If you want, case in point, current one excluded, look at pastors. They're generally pretty broken people. They've got hurt. Trust me, if they don't have hurt when they start in the ministry, they will have it when they enter because it is painful. Everybody has their own idea of what you're supposed to be doing. And if you're not doing their idea, they tell you about it, sometimes rudely. And you can't make everybody happy, and they think it's your job to make them happy. So, I was only a pastor for that long, and that church was really good to us, but I'm telling you, it's, it hurts. And yet, when we look in the Bible, and we read all of the stories in the Bible, what we see is God uses some messed up people. He used David. David was excited, and he was rearing to go, but he wasn't all that great a guy without God. He used Samson. Samson was not a good guy. Samson was a spoiled brat who wouldn't listen to his parents. He was an only child. They did whatever they wanted for him. And then he pouted when, they wanted, when he wanted a wife that was from another religion. And then she kept trying to find his power. And then he told her. Like, and she kept, like, he would lie. And then she'd try that, and it wouldn't work. And then he'd lie again, and she'd try. So finally, like, he was, not only was he spoiled, but he was stupid. But God used him. Also, not in my notes, but food for thought. Just because there's somebody that you may or may not like that's speaking up here, could be me, um, doesn't mean that God's not at work in speaking through them. So we're going to hop down to Acts 4, 5 through 12. This is going to be the one that the kids and I were talking about earlier. So in Acts 3, we learn about the beggar who was healed. But crazy enough, so there's a man healed who has been lame since birth, and he's about 40 years old, which the kids said was old, but I think that's like a baby, right? And so what do the leaders do? The leaders bring him in, and they're like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Where did this healing happen, and whose name did this healing happen? How'd you do this thing? Because we just got rid of that Jesus guy, and now you're here doing the same kind of stuff. What's going on? And I love what Peter says in verse, starting in verse 8. Then Peter... Filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed. So if you're checking us out because something good was done to a crippled man, by what means has he been healed? Let it be known. Can't you hear him saying, let me tell you. Let it be known to all of you and to all of the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. Now, every time I have ever read the scripture, I have heard, Let me tell you, that Jesus you killed, you know him. That Jesus that you murdered, you murdered him. He he overcame death. And look what he just did. He just healed this man. But this time, what I heard him say Let me tell you. You, 
and all the people of Israel. That by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, God raised from the dead, and it is by him that this man is seen on you. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you. And all of these good Jews are hearing, oh, there's that psalm about the stone that the builders rejected. That rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone And there is salvation in no other name. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common, messed up, that one's my word, not in the Bible, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident. And all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. And so then they tell them, Shh, don't say anything else in Jesus' name. We're going to let you off the hook. We're going to let you off the hook. And Peter and John answered them in the only way that they could Whether it is right in the sight of God, To listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. Okay, so I'm just going to ask you. Is it right in the sight of God for me to listen to you or to listen to God? Nancy answered. She said, God. All right, I'm going to put my little side note since I went off on preachers a minute ago anyway. When we have a pastor, we better have that expectation of ourselves there, too. It is right for whoever it is that God has sent to lead us, for that person to be seeking God and God's approval and God's direction, and for us to support in that, not for them to be pleasing us. And I'll just step right on my own toes with all of those words. So they're putting it back on them and saying, listen, you tell us, you can judge that. Should we be pleasing you or should we be pleasing God? You must judge, for we cannot but speak what we have heard and seen. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them. Because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom the sign of healing was performed, was more than 40 years old. So what's the point of the miraculous? The man, I'm sure, was thrilled to be healed, was thrilled to be whole, although I bet it majorly disrupted his life. Think about it, like you can't beg if you can walk. And healing from God will do that. I had a woman that we prayed over one time in the parking lot here, and I don't remember who prayed over her, but she had been injured in an accident in the military. and She had had back problems. And when they were praying, like she had been in pain for years and years, and when they were praying, all of that pain went away. And she was so uncomfortable with the idea of what that would do to change her lifestyle kind of freaked out, really freaked out. And so I want you to know that if you experience healing, whether it's emotionally, whether it's spiritually, whether it's physically, sometimes the reality of what it is to be healed is super uncomfortable compared, you you got used to. 
pain. You got used to being a victim. That's a big one spiritually. That's a big one emotionally. So many times we walk in a mindset that this has been done to me. This has been done to me. They are doing this. They are doing that. I am a victim. That when God comes and says, Let's heal you. Let's work through this stuff. And suddenly, you can't be a victim anymore, but you have to stand in the new truth. It's a lifestyle change, and it's very uncomfortable. And yet, we celebrate. Sometimes we have to keep moving to strengthen those legs and to find a trade that we can do in this new place. But that miracle, while it happened for the man who was lame, it happened for the people that were there. Because when they saw, they believed. When they saw, they became believers in Jesus Christ. When they saw, they were saved. Some of them. Some of them not so much. They said no. So in Sunday school today, John asked a question. When has God called you to do something that was embarrassing? That's risky business right there. My guess is there were lots of people walking by Most of them weren't paying attention. They weren't paying attention to the man. They probably weren't paying too much attention to Peter. And yet, there would have been a few. And if you lean down to say, stand up and walk, and the man couldn't get up, that would be pretty humiliating. I will leave you to judge whether it is right for you to obey God or obey your fear of being humiliated while trying to obey him. I will tell you, I choose fear a lot of the time. I won't pretend like I don't. And when I'm by myself, I'll do the crazy stuff. We had, Terry told me not to talk about this because I'll cry, but our little dog died yesterday. And I went to get it from the vets. My kids aren't here. This is probably why, because they're torn up. But I had our little body in the car. I'm driving back, and it was cold, stiff. You were right. I will cry. Lord, you told us that there's not a sparrow that falls from the sky that you don't know about and you don't care about. And I know it's selfish, but I love this little dog. She sits on my feet when I work. So many of you have so much more loss than this, and I recognize it. Laying hands on this dog, and the sun is shining, and it's getting warm in the car, so she's getting warm, and we're hitting bumps, and I'm like, come on, Jesus, come on, Jesus, do it. You can. You can. Imagine the testimony, God. Imagine the testimony. And So I get home, and I go to Deacon, and I'm like, Deacon, will you help me? Can you help me bury Frankie? He's like, yeah, so we... Goes and gets a shovel and digs the hole and lay the dog in the hole. And this time I'm not yelling like I was in the car. I'm whispering, Jesus, please, please imagine this miracle if my son sees it. Imagine this miracle if my son sees it. And I'm putting the dirt back on and I'm like, you still have time. And we're just thanking God that we got this time with her and the delight she brought us during COVID. And putting the grass back, and I'm like, you can still do it. So 
but I didn't say it nearly as boldly, and I would love to tell you that the dog rose from the dead, but as of yet, she is not. But I'm hopeful when I get home that maybe she will dig her way out. I don't know. But I don't know. There's a part of me that sits and thinks, what if I'd said it loud and my son had heard it and my fear of disappointing him if God didn't answer that prayer was lower and my faith in God to heal that little dog was bigger. Would it have been different? Would it have been like, I mean, I was quoting, I was quoting the, the guy saying, you say go and they go and you say come and they come, but I certainly wasn't doing it in front of deacons. I don't know how we're wrapping this up. There's not a happy ending to that story yet. But I do believe that the God of miracles is still the God of miracles. There's a teaching in a lot of churches that miracles ceased. Some people believe that they ceased in the Old Testament, outside of Jesus. And some people, if you want the verse, um, I looked it up. It's 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 12, that says, right now, we see in part, right now we prophesy in part, but the day is coming when we will see everything and we will fully understand and no longer will you need prophecy or the gift of tongues. And so people will say, the first century church had miracles, but we don't. Like that ceased. We have the knowledge of Jesus. We have the Bible. We have all of those things. Donna's making a face at me. She's like, that's bad theology. Here's what I will tell you. That scripture says, right now, it's like looking in a mirror. They didn't have mirrors like we have. It's like looking in a cheap old antique mirror. And you look in, and you just see a shadow of what you look like. And there's a belief that when Christ returns, we will see fully, we will know fully, we will understand fully. We're not there. I mean, if one of you knows everything and understands everything, I've got some questions for you. Come talk to me after the sermon. But we're not there. And we're not there, which means the God of miracles is still at work, and he is still using his people, his disciples, those that chase him, to touch people and to do things that bring glory to him. And we have got to take the risk, guys. We're going to be uncomfortable, and you're going to have this little thought of, oh, God is telling me to pray for this or to do this or to give this or to go there. And you're going to be like, I don't know if that's God or not. But I am telling you in that moment, I just ask Holy Spirit that you bring to our mind, you have to make the judgment about what is right. Am I going to obey God or am I going to obey man? And so today, as we get ready to wrap up, I'm finally done. Yay! I just bless you with a new level of conscience and a new connection with the Holy Spirit that you will know that you know that you know at some point this week when God is telling you to do something. And I dare you to do it. I dare you to do it. And when you're walking out the door today, I want you to find somebody and you're going to say, I'm going to call you and I'm going to tell you what that thing is. I'm going to let you know if I wimped out or if I didn't. It's okay. I wimped out three times with the woman that I prayed for who had the baby. Like three different buildings. She just kept coming back. She just kept coming back. So as we do our final song, it's a lovely one. Thank you, Joe, for picking it out. Oh, how I love Jesus. I just invite you to spend some time singing, but also asking him to come and to lead you and to open your heart for what he's doing.
Thank you, Donna. That's our blessing. She believes in miracles, she's seen miracles, and she believes with all her heart. May we all go in that spirit. Unless you're on the finance committee and then hang out. Blessings. And thank you for playing for us today.